Happy Friday, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us on this edition of Business Daily. I'm Lee Ji-yoon in Seoul. We have a lot lined up for you today, so let's get started with the day's highlights. After many twists and turns, Korea's stock market has turned 60 years old this week, and it's looking to step things up in the coming decades in a bid to become one of the world's largest stock markets. It looks like Seoul is going to see its first traditional Hanuk-style hotel, as Hotel Shilla finally gets the green light after being rejected four times. But first, Korea's foreign exchange reserves dipped for a fourth straight month in February. According to the Bank of Korea, the country's reserves came to just under 365.8 billion U.S. dollars, down around 1.5 billion from the previous month. The central bank attributed the drop to a decline in the value of non-U.S. dollar assets, such as the euro and the British pound. The British currency, for one, traded at an average of $1.38 a pound in February, down 3.5% on month. As of the end of January, Korea was the world's seventh largest holder of foreign reserves, with China topping the list. It's another red light for Korea's already struggling shipbuilding sector as it sees its order backlog falling to an 11-year low. Global shipping services firm Clarkson said the country's shipbuilders only had an order backlog of about 28.4 million compensated gross tonnages as of the end of last month, which amounts to only about one to two years' worth of work. Compensated gross tonnage, or CGT, is the unit of measure to determine the amount of work that goes into building a vessel. This dire outlook follows an overall dip in order backlog worldwide, which fell roughly 2 million CGT in February on month. Now, experts say the shipbuilding market is expected to be stuck in the bog again this year, driving companies with weak finances out of the industry. Korea's three biggest shipbuilders have been in crisis management mode since the latter half of last year. And for more on this week and next week's stock market action, we have our markets reporter Che jin Sak from SBS CNBC joining us on the phone today. Hello, jin Sak. Thanks for having me, June. Well, let's get started by looking at the Korean stock market. Tell us about yesterday's close and its overall performance leading up to today. The KOSPI rose by 0.5% to close above 1950 for the first time in two months. The Kostak surged by more than 1% to close just shy of its 670 level. Foreign investors continue buying shares in the KOSPI market for five consecutive sessions. Stabilized oil prices and better equity market performance globally have boosted investor sentiment among foreigners. The index briefly fell into negative territory when North Korea launched short-range projectiles at around 10.30 a.m., but the equity market soon rebounded and finished the session at its peak. Between Monday and Thursday, the KOSPI had surged by 2% and the cost stock had risen by 3%. Large cap, medium, and small cap stocks have all joined the rally throughout the week. Along with rising oil prices, a reserve rate cut by the People's Bank of China, or the POC, was a positive market factor all week. Then how did the Korean stock market close on the last day of this week? Two indices showed quite a mixed picture today. The Kospi had moved between positive and negative territory throughout the session, mostly affected by heavy sell-off by institutional investors. Analysts see today's sluggish market move as profit-taking activity due to the recent rally. The cost stock, however, finished strong to close above 670, helped by foreign investors. Now, looking ahead, market participants are still focusing on China. People especially have their eyes on the upcoming National People's Congress, right? That's right. China's biggest political event, two assemblies, or Lianghui, meaning two conferences in Chinese, began yesterday afternoon. Lianghui consists of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, or the CPPCC, and the National People's Congress, or the NPC. The CPPCC kicked off on March 3, and the NPC, as we mentioned, will begin its sessions tomorrow. The focus will be the annual economic growth target announced tomorrow by Premier Li Keqiang at the opening of the NPC. 
Both experts predict the Chinese government will officially declare the end of its above 7% growth trend. The country's GDP grew only by 6.9% last year, and the government is expected to suggest the growth rate will be between the range of 6.5% and 7% this year. Since 2016 is the first year of China's 13th five-year plan, details focusing on addressing overcapacity and environmental issues will be announced. We also heard today the country will expand its military budget by 7 to 8% compared to last year. Lastly, the government is expected to announce plans to expand its fiscal deficit in order to keep the country's growth rate above 6.5%, and a lot of interest will be on whether we hear more concrete moves on structural reforms. And global monetary policies are seen as important factors ahead as well. The U.S. Labor Department will disclose the country's February employment report this evening in Korea time. Market participants are eager to see the results because labor market conditions in the U.S. will affect the Federal Reserve or the Fed's monetary policy stance. Financial markets have been ruling out the possibility of a Fed rate hike at this March policy meeting, and some are even expecting no rate hikes this year. As economic indicators, including inflation, have recently shown improvements, rate hike expectations have also been surging. The March FOMC meeting will be held on March 15 to 16 local time. The Bank of Korea will hold its policy meeting on the 10th. Inversely, expectations for a rate cut have been surging in the country. Since there was one dissent on a rate hold at its last meeting, some market participants even see a BOK rate cut as a done deal. On Thursday local time, the European Central Bank or the ECB is having its monetary policy meeting as well. The ECB is expected to announce further stimulus since President Mario Draghi said the bank would review its policy at the March meeting. This has been Choi jin from SBS CNBC. Meanwhile, Korea's stock market turned 60 years old on Thursday, and from its humble beginnings, it has grown into the world's 14th largest financial market by value. And marking the anniversary, the CEO of Korea Exchange promised to overhaul the market to further boost its standing. Our Kim Min-ji has this report. 60 years ago, on March 3rd, Korea launched the Taeyeon Stock Exchange, the predecessor of the Korea Exchange. Only 12 companies were listed at the time, including four banks. Investors would raise their hands, shout out how many shares they wanted to buy, barter over the price, and after the wooden clappers were struck, the stocks would be sold. In 1983, Korea launched the Kospi, its benchmark index, followed by the tech-heavy Kostak in 1996. And over the years, the local market has experienced exponential growth with the number of listed companies on the main bourse and the secondary Kostak rising to over 1,900 as of this year. Korea now stands as the world's 14th large bourse in terms of market capitalization. According to the World Federation of Exchanges, the country's market cap stood at 1.2 trillion U.S. dollars in 2015, accounting for about 2 percent of the global market. To mark the anniversary, the Curry Exchange held an event and vowed to become a leading player. If the past 60 years we ran to the door of advanced markets, for the next 60 years we will face the challenge of becoming the world's seventh market. The CEO also stressed the need to establish a holding company to oversee the exchanges and go public, a plan that has been delayed as a revision to a relevant bill is being held up at the National Assembly. Experts also agree saying Korea needs to expand from its conventional role of managing and operating the market. The holding company and initial public offering are necessary as Korea now needs to diversify its business portfolio as well as expand into other countries like China or in regions like Southeast Asia. Going forward, experts say Korea has great potential to join the ranks of advanced markets on the back of investors' appetite thanks to the country's sound economic fundamentals and strong credit rating. Kim min Business Daily.
While the demand for traditional TVs is waning, the appetite for UHD or, or ultra high definition TV is anything but slowing. According to data by U.S. research firm IHS, global shipments of TV sets last year shrunk by 3.7 percent on year at some 226 million units. Reflecting regional uncertainties, the biggest contractions were seen in Eastern Europe at minus 28 percent and in the Middle East and Africa at minus 17 percent. By contrast, UHD TVs, also commonly referred to as 4K, recorded an on-year gain of 173 percent, with nearly 31.9 million units being shipped out. Its market share by value also climbed, surpassing full HD TVs by more than 10 percentage points. Pre-orders of Samsung's new flagship smartphones to Galaxy S7 and Galaxy S7 Edge have started in Korea. The devices are available with all three of Korea's main mobile networks, and those of you ordering early will also receive a free Samsung Gear VR headset or a wireless charging battery pack. In certain international markets, pre-orders have been available since February 21st, and some users in the U.S. have reportedly already received their phones. The global release date, meanwhile, is next Friday, March 11th. LG's latest smartphone, the G5, will also be hitting the market in the coming weeks, but there's no official release date as of yet. LG did say, though, that it will launch the G5 late this month or early next month. It's taken four long years, but it finally went through. Hotel Shilla finally received an OK to build a Hanok Hotel extension on Thursday after four previous bids were rejected by city planners. Our Eunice Kim takes a look at what is set to be Seoul City's first traditional Hanok Hotel. Fifth time's the charm for Hotel Shilla. It was 2012 when the Samsung Group-owned luxury hotel first submitted a plan to build an extension to its existing Seoul Hotel. And on Thursday, it finally received a green light from the Seoul City Planning Commission. The proposal showcases a recreation of a Hanok village. The wood-pillared traditional Korean architecture is topped with the iconic roof tiles called kiwa. The structure will be three stories above ground and three stories below, the above ground levels housing 91 guest rooms and the basement levels will have restaurants as well as underground parking. Surrounding the Hanok Hotel is a walking trail lined with pine trees, flowers, lush greens and even a traditional gazebo. What made a difference for city planners this time around was Hotel Shilla's willingness to develop not only its premises, but also that of the historic Seoul City Wall nearby. Keeping in mind the area is protected, Shilla agreed to shorten and shrink its planned property, an offer to help upgrade and improve accessibility to the 600-year-old landmark the city once designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. With approval now in the bag, Hotel Shilla will complete its design over the next year. Construction of the traditional building is set to take five years, bringing the estimated completion date of the urban Hanok-style hotel to 2022. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. It's no exaggeration to say that the far reach of Korea's cultural wave, or Hallyu, has much to do with major entertainment agencies pushing out new stars and catering to different tastes around the world. Now, those companies are looking to expand into different industries to take things beyond just entertainment. Our Lee Ju Young tells us more. Visitors can watch a music video on a giant screen installed in the ceiling all the while enjoying a meal at this five-story restaurant run by one of Korea's biggest entertainment companies, SM Entertainment. Just like how SM played a big part in creating Hallyu, we also want to establish a new Korean food culture and share it with people around the world. On top of helping build up the Hallyu craze by producing some of the biggest names in K-pop, SM has expanded its business model to include travel, TV drama production and sports management. And in order to find new sources of income and grow the company, two other entertainment giants YG and JYP Entertainment have also delved into new businesses like fashion, cosmetics and mobile games. 
YG, which runs a restaurant in the vibrant Hongdae area, says 60 percent of its customers there are from abroad. In China, Big Bang is very popular, and I'm also a fan. I heard that YG has a restaurant, so I looked it up online. Experts say distributing risk by venturing into new fields is a safer bet than focusing on one industry only. I think business diversification will benefit them in the long term. But rather than blindly expanding, I think it will be better if they make sure each project works and take it slowly from there. Market watchers also add overly ambitious expansion could put downward pressure on company finances as the entertainment giants have yet to report gains in revenue from these new ventures. This especially as competition from well-established players in each field is expected to get fiercer down the road. Lee Ju-young, Business Daily. And that wraps it up for today and this week. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll be back next week at the same time, same place for your Business Daily. Have a great weekend.